The Boogeyman is one of the most widely known tales of horror. It has all kinds of interpretations all over the world. Some seem all too real. I'm Adam Andrews, and this is the top five people who summoned the Boogeyman. Starting off at number five, parents. Look, let's just get this one right out of the way now, okay? Parents, y'all can be the worst sometimes. The whole myth of the Boogeyman came about as a way for parents to scare their kids into acting right. Like the whole, you better behave or the Boogeyman will get you thing. Absolutely the worst. Now, whenever your kid is going to sleep at night in their dark room, the house will do what houses do and settle. Or something might fall, or the wind will blow outside just a little harder than usual, and now that kid is laying in bed terrified, thinking that something is coming out of its closet or under its bed. Despite that kid's best efforts to be the best behaved kid you've ever met. Congratulations, you terrified your kid. But on the other hand, nightlight sales have probably been given a bit of a boost. So hey, you scared your kid and contributed to capitalism. Round of applause for you. Number four, Cry Baby Bridge. Down in Georgia, where all kinds of creepy pastas and urban legends are running amok, there is one bridge famous for its boogeyman, Cry Baby Bridge. Now, there are many bridges that have picked up this name in the US, but this one stands apart. What is an unassuming rickety wooden bridge with no safety rails during the daytime is the most haunted bridge in Georgia by night. The legends say that a single mother crying and hoping for the end was driving one rainy night with a small passenger in the back seat. Blinded by the rain and her own distraught tears, she drove off the rickety bridge that would later become Crybaby Bridge. The water below was not horribly deep, but for a woman who didn't care for her life and the helpless one in the back, the water brought the end. Since that day, a legend arose warning against anyone who dare stop on the bridge and turn off their headlights. Who better to test out urban legends than a group of six bored teenagers who had read the urban legend and decided to investigate. They piled into a car and drove out to Crybaby Bridge on a dark, unlit road surrounded by dense thickets of trees and brush. The teenagers drove out onto the 30-foot bridge as it creaked and crackled under the weight of their car. All at once, they agreed to get out of the car, but as they did, something below used their movement as cover for its own. The group grew quiet, trying to bring on whatever was supposed to happen, but as they grew quiet, so did the nightlife around. No crickets, no birds, no frogs. After a moment of silence, the faint sound of a crying baby slowly began to echo from downstream. Below the bridge, something was moving, trying to slip through the water without making too much sound. Then a figure, man-like but all out of whack, appeared at the end of the bridge. It had a huge face with little beady black eyes, a huge nose but flattened. The face was covered in thick reddish hair, and from its mouth were the sounds of a crying baby. But as the teens shone their light on this creature, the crying stopped. Now, the nine foot tall creature stepped forward, a huge, muscular creature with elongated arms. As the teens recoiled in horror, another similar creature began reaching up from under the bridge, trying to get a hold on an ankle. This was a trap. What happens next? Well, you have to read the rest for yourself, sorry. Number three, the Bye Bye Man. Eli was a graduate student living in the town of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin in the fall of 1990 with his girlfriend Catherine and a friend named Jonathan. Someone had found an old Ouija board in an attic and for fun, gave it to the three friends who had been living together. Just like any group of friends would, the three began conducting experiments with the board, seeing if this whole superstition thing was real. Turns out they had a pretty wild ride. After they believed they had communicated with a number of spirits, they decided to make an effort to contact a spirit that had actually been a living human. The board eventually transmitted the story of the Bye Bye Man, a blind albino man born in Louisiana sometime in the 1920s. According to the story, his parents put him in an orphanage in Algiers, New Orleans, where he was shunned. The boy eventually escaped the orphanage and turned to the life of a killer. Jumping on trains and traveling around wherever he wanted, he was accompanied by his companion called Gloom Singer, which was a dog-like creature sewn together from the tongues and the eyes of his victims. Well, unfortunately, the three friends, Eli, Catherine, and Jonathan, were told via the 
Ouija board that the spirit of the Bye Bye Man had latched onto them and that he was coming for them. Apparently, anyone who thought of or said the Bye Bye Man's name became his next target. He then began riding the rails in their direction, sending out Gloomsinger to locate the person. Once they were found, Gloomsinger would let out a shrill whistle to call to the Bye Bye Man. The history of the Bye Bye Man is traced back to a teenager who told a reporter that he took his family's lives because the Bye Bye Man made him do it. Luckily for Eli, Catherine, and Jonathan, they were not driven to hurt anyone, but they were definitely scared out of their skin. There is a movie based on this story, but in that one, things don't end so nicely. Number two, Terry Sherman. The great thing about the Boogeyman is that it has no one form. It's just the manifestation of whatever people fear. For the Native American Navajo people, this would be the Skinwalker. Now before I get into this, everything I tell you is coming from the brief amounts of research I did when making this video, so if I get something wrong or mispronounce certain things, feel free to politely correct me in the comments below. Similar but not the same to the Russian Baba Yaga, the Skinwalker is a kind of wicked sorcerer who can transform into, occupy, or disguise themselves as an animal. It has deep roots in Aboriginal American folklore. Other tribes throughout the region also have their own versions of the Skinwalker. The Pueblo people, Apache, and Hopi people each have their own unique interpretation of what a Skinwalker might be. Some believe that Skinwalkers are produced when a medicine man abuses magic for evil, corrupting the natural order of things, turning them into an evil entity capable of controlling and turning into animals, or even possessing others. There's also another version that says that one becomes a skinwalker by performing some kind of taboo act, similar to the tale of the Wendigo. In Navajo stories, the Nagloshi were agents for the holy people when they were first training humans in the blessing way. Nagloshi were supposed to abandon the mortal world with the holy people, but a few decided to stay behind. Their greed and desire to stay in the mortal plane corrupted the power the holy people gave them and transformed them into malicious semi-divine beings. Now, I'm actually putting myself in quite a bit of danger here even talking about this, as these beings are not something you are supposed to talk about. Even the people who named this being aren't willing to talk about it, especially not with outsiders, so be courteous and don't go asking about it. Most of you have likely heard of Sherman Ranch, also known as Skinwalker Ranch. This ranch near Ballard, Utah, is apparently a cursed lot of land that has had many different kinds of encounters. One is of interest to us right now. Terry Sherman, the owner of the property way back in 1996, was walking his dogs around the farm late at night when he came upon a wolf. A wolf three times the size of a regular one with glowing red eyes and an incredibly mean look. Terry claims to have attacked the beast, but no evidence is actually available. Was this the Navajo's boogeyman? Who knows? Number one, Cropsy. Okay, this one is going to get a bit more real. In Staten Island, USA, a tale of a boogeyman-like creature named Cropsy was famous among many kids who lived in the area. Cropsy was said to be an axe-wielding man who escaped from a mental institution and would lurk around in the dark tunnels below the old abandoned Willowbrook State School, a facility for children with intellectual disabilities that was shuttered after allegations of horrific mistreatment were exposed. The story the story says Cropsy comes out at night to snatch young people and bring them back into the abandoned Willowbrook. But the horror tale was actually a horrifying reality. Cropsy was in actuality Andre Rand, a suspected killer who was convicted for the passing of two young individuals in the 1970s. In keeping with the tale, Rand worked as a janitor at Willowbrook in the mid 1960s. Before his capture, Rand was homeless and living in a makeshift campsite on the grounds of the abandoned school, not far from the Sea View hospital that was so closely tied to the Cropsey legend. Rand's story and the tale of Cropsey continues to fascinate and horrify kids and even adults to this day. In fact, two filmmakers, Joshua Zeman and Barbara Brancaccio, grew up on Staten Island and listened to the terrifying Cropsey stories when they were children. As adults, their curiosity led them to dig deeper into the urban legend of Cropsey and the real cases of the island's missing people. They even made a documentary, Cropsey, that explores the bizarre case of the boogeyman who seem to come to life. That's all the time we have for today. I'm Adam Andrews. This is the Top 5 Scary Videos. Make sure to stay safe out there. <laughs>